Here at Energy Media, we spend a lot of time talking about energy narratives, how we think and talk about energy, particularly in Canada. And that's why I was really interested to read uh, an article, an op-ed actually, in the conversation by Amy Janswood, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Political Science at the University of British Columbia. And her op-ed is entitled, A Bridge to Nowhere, Natural Gas Will Not Lead Canada to a Sustainable Energy Future. So welcome to the interview, Amy. Thanks so much, Markham. It's great to be back. Well, it's nice to interview you again. I think I interviewed you a couple of years ago when you were at the University of Toronto. And uh, I, I'm very interested in this because uh, I've been arguing for a while that what we're doing is focusing too much of our attention in Canada on the fuels or the energy of the 20th century. So not so much coal, but certainly oil and gas, and not on the energy of the 21st century, which is clearly emerging as clean electricity and then low carbon fuels like hydrogen, sustainable energy uh, fuels, and so on. And, and natural gas seems to be one of those, you know, those old fuels that as soon as there's a shortage, as there is now in, in, in global markets and particularly in Europe, the it just the industry gets on their old hobby horse about how we need to have more LNG and oh my goodness why didn't we do this years ago and 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 it just dominates the conversation and we stop talking about everything else and that seems to fit with your narrative. Yeah, I think you're completely right, Markham. And just before we begin, I want to acknowledge that this work is based off an article that I published with my colleague, Dr. Heather Miller at the University of New Brunswick. And we, we write in that article uh, in energy and social science research that uh, really, like you said, this idea of natural gas as an essential part of Canada's energy future is really alive and well. And we've actually seen this narrative be quite durable over time, although the form has taken uh, a few, few twists and turns over the last few years. And we see this narrative really alive and well in Alberta, in British Columbia, but also uh, somewhat surprising to, to folks in Ontario and Quebec as well. Although the way that folks are talking about natural gas is different in each of these provinces, but uh, certainly there is really a lot of um, a lot of support amongst uh, natural gas industry and amongst uh, premiers in in the provinces that I mentioned to push forward this idea that natural gas is an essential part of of our energy transition, and we think it's problematic for for quite a few reasons. But uh, but we can get into that in a minute. Look, you talked about Alberta and BC, and I, I think their narratives are pretty similar, which is basically that natural gas, uh, particularly what it's used for uh, fire, you know, not, uh, for making power uh, electricity and power plants, uh, can contribute to greenhouse gas emissions in other countries, particularly in Asia. And, and China usually gets used as the example. Mm -hmm. The problem is, I don't think that's tied at all to the reality uh, overseas, because I, I interview experts all the time. In fact, I just interviewed one from uh, S&P Global uh, last week, and who made the point that China is uh, canceling uh, coal plants. The um, capacity factors, the amount that it's they're used, are now have fallen below fifty percent and and are falling because China is going all in on renewables and. And and so this idea that somehow we're going to build infrastructure, LNG infrastructure that takes five or ten years, and then we're going to get uh, you know ch help China get off of coal, they're already doing it. It's it's like it's like you know we're the conversation in Canada is is stuck in the you know it's ten or fifteen years old. It's not rooted in the realities that we're actually seeing on the ground in the supposed markets. I think you're absolutely right. And this narrative is strongest in British Columbia, where there's been attempts, you know, for the last number of years to develop the LNG export facilities. But I'll just add to that, that uh, this idea of helping, you know, particularly China transition off of coal using natural gas is flawed, especially when you think about the life cycle emissions of natural gas. And there's studies that show in China, uh, you know, forecasting out uh, their coal industry, that uh, actually the life cycle emissions, if they switch from coal to natural gas, would actually be higher. Uh, so this, this narrative is, is um, problematic for a few reasons. 
Uh, one, because in BC, additional LNG production is not accounted for in the climate plan. And also this narrative distracts from the fact that BC is Canada's largest exporter of coal. So, uh, you know, that hypocrisy tends to get glazed over when, when you listen to uh, LNG proponents talk about this idea of using natural gas to not only help other countries like China transition, but also to meet BC's own climate targets. And there's, there's uh, very little evidence to support that is true. And in fact, we actually see that uh, emissions from upstream oil and gas production have been consistently underreported, and that's due to methane emissions. And so that's that's a huge problem as well. Right. I, I'm I'm willing. I'm less um, critical of the the methane emissions because uh, the the governments in Alberta and BC and uh, and also their you know federal initiatives and and regulations on this as well. Uh, we're call, we're calling for a 75 percent uh, decrease in oil and gas methane emissions by 2030. The industry is already well on its way because so much of the methane emissions are you know they're leaks from broken valves and equipment like uh, uh, equipment that can be replaced uh, rather easily as part of repair and maintenance programs. Uh, but the, the thing that that I can't get over is that the these arguments are advanced by both government and by industry. And I have yet to see credible analyses that show that any gas turned into LNG exported to Asia will actually displace coal. I mean, it seems to be this a priori kind of argument that if we do this, they will do that. Where's the evidence for that? Yeah, certainly. You certainly see the sort of the shifting sands of these arguments. You see it a bit less so now, uh, particularly in BC under the Horton government, although it's it's changed form. You see now a lot more uh, justification of LNG production during the COVID era as a way to uh, have economic recovery. And so you see, you know, once there's been, I think, a quite a bit of pushback against this narrative, it sort of, uh, you know, shifts a little bit, right? And so you, you start to see now again with uh, the U Ukraine, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you now see this narrative being, you know, sparked once again. Uh, again, there's lots of problems with this narrative and, and not a lot of evidence to support it, but this is sort of the, the latest way that proponents are, are justifying, uh, you know, sort of fantasies about, uh, you know, invigorating the, the LNG industry in, in Canada. Uh, you call uh, this this narrative climate delay. Uh, I in in columns I've and other interviews I've talked called it climate slow walking. Mm. But I think that's a really good point. Is you know they make the argument that we can't do anything about these things now. Uh, therefore, we should put it off into the future, and we should uh, you know maybe there's. A perceived um, economic opportunity, market opportunity for LNG, especially now with the European uh, gas crisis going on, and that's where we should that's where we should uh, focus. We should, you know, expedite uh, environmental approvals and and regulatory delays, and we should pour capital in into these things. And and really, what it is is you know this argument that clean Canadian oil and gas can somehow help decarbonize the world. Uh, is such a fallacious idea. It, it's it's kind of ridiculous in a way. You know, our oil in particular is is highly carbon intensive, so it's really a form of climate slow walking. And it's almost like I mean, you know, I see this come out of the oil and gas industry all the time. You know, every couple of years there'll be a new narrative. It's almost like you know one of their PR firms uh, crafted a document. And it was distributed to the industry and suddenly everybody's talking, you know, using the same talking points. And now climate delay, climate slow walking seems to be the latest one. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There's a reason why this narrative is so appealing. And it's it's for the reason that oil and gas is struggling in Canada. And the reality of transition is extremely painful. And having this idea of natural gas as a bridge fuel or in some cases, you know, as a permanent part of Canada's energy mix in the future, as you know, folks at CAP, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, uh, suggests, this is a really appealing narrative for an industry that's 
really at a crossroads. And, and we have seen some shift in, in oil and gas industry in Canada. Some folks, uh, and particularly the Canadian Gas Association, are really branching out, talking more about alternatives to natural gas, whereas others are doubling down uh, at CAP and, and other industry associations. And so this narrative is really misleading. It, it's enticing because it tells citizens that, uh, you know, we will decarbonize in the future, but there is no honesty or transparency about what that actually means. And in fact, you know, this idea of supporting natural gas as part of a future decarbonization effort really means supporting natural gas today and investing in infrastructure that really becomes risk of, of becoming stranded assets in the future. And I think we should point out that currently, or like I say, over the last year, the oil and gas industry is actually doing really well. I mean, they're making record profits. A lot of that is on on the back of of high oil prices. Uh, but it's also true that natural gas prices have doubled or tripled. And uh, so gas producers are doing well uh, as well. Uh, but I, I think the the big issue here for me is the fact that anytime you build uh, hydrocarbon infrastructure, if you're building a pipeline, if you're building, you know, a, a new plant, this is 50 year infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And everywhere you go, uh, every if you look at Europe, if you look at Asia, everybody uh, in the United States, I mean, they just passed the, the Inflation Reduction Act. It's all about electrifying the economy, electrifying transportation with, with you know, EVs, electrifying industrial processes, electrifying buildings with, uh, with heat pumps and other, and other uh, electric technologies. The world is not going in the direction of hydrocarbons. It's going in the act, opposite direction. And here we are in Canada trying yet to double down uh, on the past instead of doubling down on the future. And that, I think, you know, kind of gets captured in your uh, in your op-ed. Yeah, I think you're totally right. And I think your point about price increases right now is really important. We've seen this again and again. Of course, there's a lot of, you know, price volatility in oil and gas, but when you do see those oil and, and you know, gas prices go up, there's an immediate rush, right, with proposals, uh, with, you know, expansion plans. But then those, the reality, you know, quickly catches up in terms of what, IEA and others, you know, forecasts in the longer term and, you know, changing demand for oil and gas and, and peak demand and the, that kind of thing. With natural gas, there is this sort of ambiguous position in the global economy about what that means. Although, as we've talked about in Canada, there's a lot of reasons uh, to be very deeply skeptical, uh, to be deeply skeptical about the profitability and economic case for LNG uh, because of the, the long lead time to develop the infrastructure, the long economic life of the infrastructure. Uh, you know, speaking purely in economic terms, uh, there hasn't been an, an economic case, even when oil um, and gas prices were quite high several years ago, uh, you still had a, a lot of cancellations of LNG terminals and this kind of thing um, on the coast of BC. So there's those things have not changed, uh, even though we have right now uh, high oil and gas prices. Right. Well, look, Amy, thank you very much for this. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, again, this is about narrative. I, I can see some of my oil and gas uh, insiders who are watching this now and their heads exploding because, you know, they'll have arguments about some of the details. But if you step back, and this is something Canadians are not doing very good right now, and I, and I have a bit of a, a different perspective because we interview so many international experts, so we get more of an internet, you know, a, a different view on global markets and where energy is headed, and, and new technologies and policies, and and it's it, that's the thing is we you know. Yes, there may there will uh, gas is going to be used for a long time, and you know the it's not like we're Canadian gas producers are, are going, to, going to go out of business or should go out of business tomorrow, but it's the direction of the future, which is not towards gas. And that's the, the point, I think. That's why I wanted to interview you about this. I think that comes through loud and clear in your, in your op-ed. So thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. Thanks so much, Markham. It's been a pleasure.